very much, everybody. And now we'll finish with a, a second reading, a proper reading. I think I'm going to read three times, but it might be four. The first one really doesn't need, I think, any kind of crossing at all. <clears throat> it's called the grain of things. Beware of what's uniform, lapidary, slick. As if a twisting country lane where shadows bow and curtsy were to be avoided because of its green spine and blisters. Or it were desirable that literary translations should not sound foreign and close to the originals. Wax and skin fruit is apt to taste less sweet than the boxed potato and ruffled pomegranate. Let me have about me not members of the awkward squad or fools so cussed they cannot compromise, but friends who think and say what they think, not given to repeat themselves with variations. Men and women with robust word backs who deal in things no less than intuitions and cast their cloaks before the beautiful. Salt milled stone has its place, oil has its place, likewise the assembly line. And though I have no wish to be abraded when I am low in spirits, or to listen to the litanies of the bigoted, nor even to be pricked by the moustache of an hour as well. But give me the gruff, the honest stumble and crux, the obstinate knot in the grain of things. This may have happened even before Inoni and I arrived, but if so, it can be said twice. May I, on everyone's behalf, thank Lucy and herself, such a distinguished poet, and Jenny for all the efforts they've put into planning this day, and the literary website, and there is a much more besides. Well, let's give them a hand. I'm old enough to have heard John Kelly um, speaking in here many a time, um, a lisping speech usually, um, to a tipsy audience. This was when the entire college somehow managed to cram in uh, and eat here, usually at a couple's dinner. And as one who got colours in tennis and squash and um, hockey, I was regarded by with derision by my sports colleagues for writing poetry, and with no less derision by my poet friends for playing sport. <laughs> <laughs> but things came adrift when, of all things, I failed my Anglo-Saxon prelims. Uh, and I remember being drawn not just before my tutor, but before the entire body of fellows somewhere up there who said, well, we wouldn't, John Pierce said, we wouldn't like to lose you, Mr. Crosby Holland. Um, and I urge you to. Uh, past Priel and Bruce Mitchell, of course, for those of you who remember him or have heard of him, was absolutely appalled that one of his students with a failed Anglo Saxon prelims and <laughs> alternated tennis uh, bouts on tennis courts uh, with extra help, which in the event went on right through my 20s. So the two of the first three books that I wrote were with Bruce, as, as some of you may know translations of some of the shorter old English poems and a Beowulf. Um, this poem is called Translation Workshop, Grit and Blood. And I wanted to see whether it was possible to translate the famous last lines, or virtually the last lines of the Battle of Malden, um, the Beard's World of Words, in words entirely derived from Anglo-Saxon, or whether it would seem just cranky in the sort of way that, do you remember William Barnes, who taught Thomas Hardy, espoused a kind of language that was entirely derived from Old English. In the event, other than the word spirit, which I borrowed from Latin, um, the second stanza here is indeed 
entirely derived from sex. He got Shatahara, he got to the Kena, Mo Shatamara, the Oramagan, Litla. Words stand, locking shield wall, not to be broken down, nor even translated in its own bright coin. Courage, intention, resolve won't do. Out with Latinates, I want earth words, tough roots, grit and blood, grunt, bleed. Harder heads and hearts more keen, spirits on fire as our strength flanks. Here lies our leader, <coughs> axed and limp, the top dog in the dust. He who turns from this war play now will mourn forever. I'm old, I'll stay put, I'll lay my pillow on the ground. Beside my dear man, my loved lord. What a lovely place to have a chance to read that. <laughs> and the third poem, the last one, I guess, um, is called The Mountains of Norfolk. The title poem of my new and selected poems published last year. Noel Coward has a great deal to answer. Isn't that true, Eloise? How dare to call Norfolk um, Indeed, we live on an eminence about 165 feet high, uh, outside the village of Burnham Market, and salt. Do you live in Cromer as well? No, you don't, but salt, of course, are in Cromer. Um, and which is where George Macbeth used to live at one point for a short while. We really ought to be invoking the poets who have read in here and were all men in their time, the greatest perhaps in, our, in the last century. We used to probably say, wouldn't you, it's Jeffrey Brixen. Um, a, really, a very fine poet, and if not an alpha poet, nevertheless one of those poets who every time you turn to him, at least I found, makes you unaccountably glad to be alive. He teases out knots in the brain of things. It's an absolutely lovely poet. In the event, the mountains of Norfolk um, is uh, about the claps of sugar beet, which get loaded onto lorries and prevent your driving in any direction um, from North Norfolk at an average speed of more than 40 miles for the first hour. Mm -hmm. And I suppose this is a poem of invective, really. Um, in praise of sugar beet, the mountains of Norfolk. Monstrous claps of the great unwashed. Grubby little ordens, dwarf hippopotami of the green kingdom. Each one's the sum of its own prehistory. They smell rank already. Not like rotten trout glowing in the dark, but rubbish we forgot to chuck out yesterday. Talk about the mountains of Norfolk. Chalky cephalopods, their suckers and tubers thick as penises, grizzled old grout heads, some scalped or shorn like combatants, some with bristles wound round their waists, warty, misshapen tubs, this with several snouts, that with the hooded eye of a giant tortoise. Here's the head with the grin of a shake of a gaping shark. Not one of them has aged beautifully. <laughs> They're like fetuses cropped from milky wounds, unformed or malformed. Boxing gloves with knobs on them. Very much more heavy than they can possibly be. Horny, lacerated, inescapably coarse. Not one has ever dreamed a wild dream or seen an angel. These stubborn these thousands of stubborn brothers, pitted, hocked, and jaundiced, on a dark night, you might want to avoid them, or hunker down against the roaring body smashers. Soon, the bubbling pyre. Soon, the sickly pool. When at last, the fowl shall be beautiful, and they too become authors of sweetness.